Welcome to another episode of Too Close to Home, the series where we dig up creepy stories, haunted places, and mysteries from our very own Patreon's hometowns. This episode, we're looking at Jose, Rio, Amanda, James, and Harry's locations, and do we have some good stories in store for you five? If you want us to dig up stories from your area, head on over to Patreon and join our Too Close to Home tier. Thank you everyone for supporting, and now, hit those lights, sit back, and enjoy. Jose, Santa Cruz, California. What can we say about Santa Cruz? It has everything, from good weather to amazing beaches and woodland scenery. However, like everything, looks can be deceiving, as it also has a darker side, and in true top five style, that is what we're going to look at for our Patreon and Santa Cruz resident, Jose. First, we'll take a look at his creepy links to Alfred Hitchcock. Sunshine Villa is a rather imposing building nestled at the top of a hill near the Santa Cruz boardwalk. Today, it's an assisted living facility housing 124 residents. However, the building has gone through many reincarnations since it was first built in 1867, and in the late 1800s was substantially extended and turned into a hotel called Hotel McRae. For many years in the late 1800s to mid 1900s, it welcomed guests. However, with the increase in motor cars, the demand for hotel stays declined and the building started falling into a state of disrepair, taking on a rather creepy looking facade. During the 1960s, influential filmmaker and master of suspense, Alfred Hitchcock, lived in the area and while looking for inspiration for a film, came across the then dilapidated building, Hotel McRae, and allegedly drew inspiration for the fictional Bates Motel in the film Psycho. But that's certainly not the only creepy thing about the building. Apparently, it's also haunted, with guests and employees said to have reported inexplicable cold spots and ghostly voices, along with eerie lights and even Satanists. Another little story about Santa Cruz and Hitchcock is that his horror movie, The Birds, that he adapted from Daphne Demure's novel, was filming at around the time of an actual event that occurred in Santa Cruz on August 18th, 1961, when residents in the Pleasure Point and Capitola area were awakened at 3 a.m. by a massive flight of sooty shear waters colliding with buildings and floundering in the streets. Those who investigated with torchlights were terrified as thousands of the birds flew towards their lights, causing them to hurry back inside. When they later opened their doors in the light of day, they found dead and stunned seabirds littering the streets and roads outside their homes. The poor birds had disgorged bits of fish and fish skeletons all over the roads, lawns and rooftops, left an overpowering stench of fish. Apparently Hitchcock used accounts of what happened to add to his film. Officials later determined that the particularly heavy fog that night reflected the city's lights in a way that confused the animals causing them to terrify the residents with their erratic behavior. Next up, let's cover the mysterious disappearance of Ronald Dean Lavalle Jr. Ronald was born on January 2nd, 1968, but apart from that, very little information is available on his early life. Ronald was last seen on January 25th, 1988, age 20, at his residence in the 400 block of Midway Ranch Road in Boulder Creek, California, where he lived with two of his friends. The exact circumstances of his disappearance are unknown, as his friends gave investigators several verifying accounts. Initially, the pair said that Ronald had been abducted and murdered by biker types, and they later walked this statement back and claimed that his story was simply a bad dream. Later, the 20-year-old's friends insisted that he'd moved to Las Vegas without notifying his family. Detectives, however, were unable to find any trace of Ronald in the area, and it was soon proved that this account was false. The only thing Ronald's friends told law enforcement that is considered to be even remotely true was that he'd been using cocaine and marijuana regularly, and that he was involved in a string of small-time burglaries. His father, Ronald Sr., confirmed this claim, but believed that it was for medicinal purposes. It has been alleged that Ronald Jr. was involved in a small marijuana trafficking operation at the time of his disappearance, and investigators believe that he may have knowledge of a deliberately set fire in Santa Cruz that destroyed five businesses, including one owned by the 20-year-old's roommates. Furthermore, before he vanished, 
Ronald was seen by his family with large amounts of cash that he was unwilling to account for. While foul play is suspected in the case, it has largely gone cold in the recent years since Ronald went missing. His father, Ronald Sr., believes that his son was murdered and that his body has never been found. The family and their plight hit the headlines again in December 2002 when Ronald Jr.'s brother, David Shane Lavalley, who was 13 months younger, attacked the sibling's father, leaving him in the hospital, where he received stitches for the wounds to his scalp. They were described by police officers as deep lacerations. David had reportedly struck Ronald Sr. several times with a hatchet outside of their rented cabin on Highway 9. Notably, this wasn't David's first run-in with the law. Reporters who covered the story discovered that the 33-year-old had 36 cases against him for charges including burglary, sex crimes, and various drug-related offences. As for the incident involving David and his father, law enforcement officials stated that it was a miracle Ronald Sr. didn't die. While they didn't publicly reveal what prompted the attack, Ronald Sr. told media outlets that it was due to the stress of his brother's disappearance, stating, My son has had some problems since his brother disappeared. He's never been the same. My family has been devastated since that time. Reportedly, since Ronald Jr. went missing, David has struggled with depression and has bouts of delusions. The pair argued on Christmas Day when David urged his father to stop investigating the case, telling him to let it go but Ronald Sr. refused. Ronald told the Santa Cruz Sentinel, it's a very small valley here, people know, it's so frustrating. I've been going through hell for 14 years. Ronald Sr. previously owned Mountain Juice Bar in the Ben Lamond area, but as of 2002, he was on disability benefits with David. In the years since Ronald Jr.'s vanishing, his father has searched tirelessly for him, prodding investigators for progress updates hanging posters in the local area, and giving interviews to try and keep interest in his son's case alive. In 2002, he was dedicating one day a week to working on the case. As for David, after attacking his father, the 33-year-old fled on foot and hid in the nearby woods for a short time, before walking along Highway 9, where he was spotted by authorities and arrested. While Ronald Sr. declined to press charges against his son, Investigators told him that the incident couldn't be ignored. In the end, the attempted murder charge against him was dropped, and David instead faced charges of assault with a deadly weapon, plus enhancement of causing great bodily harm using a deadly weapon, and having a prior record. He faced eight years in prison for the crime. Ronald Jr.'s case is cold and unsolved. He was 20 years old when he went missing on January 25th, 1988, and is described as being a white male with brown hair and brown eyes, standing at 5 feet 8 and weighing around 160 pounds. His left ear is pierced and he has a scar on the right side of his cheek. He often goes by the nickname Ronnie. Rio Wheat Ridge, Golden, Colorado. Rio's hometown is Wheat Ridge, Colorado, a cute little suburb of Denver, surrounded by mountains. However, Rio has asked us to look at a story in the next city over from Wheat Ridge, a place called Golden. Golden is home to the headquarters and brewery of Coors Beer, and is where the company started out in 1873, and it's the tragic kidnapping of Adolf Coors III that Rio has asked us to cover, and so we will. Enjoy, Rio. Adolf Kors III was born on January 12, 1915, in Golden, Colorado. He was the grandson of Adolf Kors, who founded the Kors Brewery in Colorado in 1873. Growing up in a life of luxury, Adolf III was not known to be a slacker nor a snob. He was well-liked and well-respected, and considered a pillar of the community, and a wholesome family man. Much to his father's distaste, he was allergic to beer, and had no interest in taking over the Kors business but he did so out of duty. Adolf reportedly dreamt of owning a cattle and horse operation instead. As a boy, Adolf attended the Phillips Exeter Academy in New Hampshire before going on to graduate from Cornell University as a young man. Here he was president of the Quill and Dagger Society and a member of the Kappa Alpha Society. For some time, he became a professional baseball player. 
Then, in 1940, he married Mary Urquhart. The couple had four children together. In the early 1960s, Adolf held the position of CEO and chairman of the board of the Coors Brewery Company, still located in Golden, and on February 9th, he kissed his wife goodbye and got into his car to head to work. Little did Mary know that this would be the last time she'd see her husband alive. Later that morning, the local milkman came to a stop at a one-track bridge named Turkey Creek Bridge. Honking his horn impatiently, the milkman waited for the vehicle in the center of the bridge to move, but the car, an international harvester travel all, remained still. Deciding to inspect the situation further, the milkman hopped out of his van and strode towards the car on the bridge. The engine was running and the radio was on, but curiously, there was nobody inside. It was then that he noticed a reddish brown pool on the ground and a hat laying nearby. Now concerned, the milkman retreated from the scene and called the authorities. When the police arrived, they quickly identified the abandoned vehicle as belonging to Adolf Kors III, and an extensive search party was assembled and launched. The group managed to find Adolf's glasses, but there was no further signs of the missing CEO. The following day, his distraught wife, Mary, received a ransom letter that demanded half a million dollars in exchange for her husband's safe return. Following the advice of law enforcement, the mother of four attempted to respond to the kidnapper, but heard nothing further from them. The subsequent search for Adolf and the perpetrator was the biggest FBI effort since the kidnapping of the Lindenberg baby in 1932. But despite the best efforts of law enforcement, the case stalled for several months. Then on September 11th, 1960, a hiker found a pair of trousers in the Rocky Mountains. Inside the pocket, he found a penknife engraved with the initials AC III. Four days later, a human skull and his shirt and jacket was located in a remote area near Pikes Peak. The clothing had several bullet holes in it, and the skull was soon identified as belonging to Adolf. Investigators got their first real crack in the case when a witness revealed that he'd seen a yellow 1951 Mercury on the bridge at the time of the disappearance. The witness recalled several numbers and letters on the plate, although he was unable to remember the full thing and the order they were in. The plate included AT and 62. This was a huge help to detectives, however, who traced the vehicle to Atlantic City, New Jersey, where it had been abandoned in a dump and set on fire. By the time law enforcement recovered the shell of the car, it had been burned out. From here, the car was traced back to a Colorado resident going by the name of Walter Osborne, who had moved out of his apartment on the day Adolf vanished. Law enforcement learned that Osborne had an insurance policy at his previous job, the beneficiary of which was a convicted killer named Joseph Corbett Jr. They also discovered that Osborne had recently come into the possession of handcuffs, a gun, and a typewriter. Looking into this further, they decided that Walter Osborne was simply an alias for Corbett. Corbett's co-workers had overheard him talking about a plan that would earn him over $1 million. Furthermore, his typewriter matched the typeface on the ransom note. Joseph Corbett Jr. was born on October 25, 1928. He had lived a relatively normal life until 1951, when he was charged with murder after shooting a man in the back of the head. He had claimed this was self-defense, but this reasoning didn't sway the jury, and he was swiftly convicted. Following the sentencing, he spent some time in a maximum security prison in California, but was later moved to a minimum security prison for good behavior. This proved to be a mistake, as Corbett promptly fled the minimum security prison and had been on the run ever since. Corbett's photograph was put into papers nationwide and circulated not just in the US, but also in Canada. It was here in Winnipeg that someone finally recognized the killer. The manager of a rooming house got in touch with authorities when she noticed one of her tenants resembled the man in the photographs shared in the newspapers. Authorities were quick to take action. They soon apprehended Corbett and brought him back to Colorado, where he was charged and given a trial. As there were no witnesses to the crime, prosecutors built their case against Corbett using forensic and circumstantial evidence, including the conversation overheard by his co-workers, the typeface of the ransom note, and the fact that the note was written on paper with a distinct watermark, which matched paper purchased by Corbett. 
Additionally, Adolf's niece recognised him as a man she'd seen loitering near the house in the week leading up to the kidnapping and subsequent murder. The biggest piece of evidence, however, was the dirt found in the undercarriage of the Mercury, which matched that which was found in the area where Adolf's body was found. Investigators theorised that Corbett had lured Adolf to him by pretending to have broken down on the bridge. When the father of four approached him to lend a hand, Corbett produced a gun and attempted to force Adolf into the vehicle, but he refused and fled instead. Corbett, instead of letting him run, shot him in the back. On March 29, 1961, Corbett was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to life behind bars. Although throughout his life, he maintained his innocence. Despite not serving his previous sentence fully, since he'd escaped prison, Corbett was released on parole in 1980 for good behaviour. Up until his retirement, he drove a truck for the Salvation Army. He took his own life in August of 2009, aged 80, after learning that he had cancer. He lived and died 10 miles from where he murdered Adolf Kors III. Notably, this isn't the first time the Kors family was subjected to a kidnapping plot. In 1934, Adolf's father, Adolf Kors II, became the focus of a kidnapping scheme devised by Paul Robert Lane, the former state prohibition agent for Colorado, along with three other men. They planned to abduct Adolf II and demand $50,000 in exchange for his safe return and plotted for the person who delivered the money to go to three different points to ensure they weren't being tailed by police officers before splitting the money. They intended on dropping Adolf II safely in the Colorado Springs area. However, none of this occurred because the Denver police learned of the plot while working on an auto theft ring. While Adolf volunteered to pose as bait and allow the kidnapping to take place so that investigators could apprehend the suspects. Paul Robert Lane was arrested on auto theft charges before that happened and so the conspiracy was thwarted before it could occur. James Brooker, Hull, England Kingston upon Hull, usually abbreviated to Hull, is a port city in the East Riding of Yorkshire, England. It's a diverse city with many museums of national importance and a rich history dating back to the 12th century. It is also known for its slightly quirky cream phone boxes, as opposed to the traditional red ones found in all other parts of the UK. The traditional red phone box was to mark King George V's Silver Jubilee in 1935. However, despite the same kiosks being installed in Hull, they decided theirs were going to be a little different, so they painted them cream and without crowns to show their independence from the post office, who used to run phone communications. The kiosks remain cream to this day and are unique to the city of Hull and part of East Yorkshire, although not many are used as actual phone boxes these days. For James, we're going to take a look first at the paranormal side of Hull, followed by the perplexing murder of Hayley Morgan. Hull is home of the term ghost hunter. In 1852, vast portions of land in Allaby Road in the city were devoted to large gardens and orchids and it was here in October of that year that one of the earliest ghost stories was reported. It was at the home of William B. of Wellington Gardens that strange spirit tappings were heard. William reported the incident to the Hull Press, which in turn went national, then international, with newspapers all over the world discussing the case. It was never solved, but it was the first time that scientific minds were dragged into the world of paranormal, and the first ever mention of a ghost hunter was printed in Hull's Press. Another well-known ghost story from Hull occurred at Hull Prison, a place that has a long, dark history with ten officially sanctioned hangings in its grounds. One of the ghosts said to haunt the prison is Ethel Major, the last and only woman to be hanged at the prison on December 19, 1931. Ethel was convicted of poisoning her husband, Arthur, by lacing his corned beef sandwiches with strychnine. After her death, she was reportedly seen near the condemned cell, in an extraordinary twist of the claims, in August 1971, the Hull Daily Mail ran an article from the Home Office which stated that they had launched a full and thorough investigation into claims that prisoners and staff had sighted the ghost. However, after an investigation, they found no evidence of any paranormal activity at the prison. Haley Morgan Case On May 27, 1999, the body of a woman was found in an alley off Beverly Road between Ashgrove and Beechgrove in Hull, England. 
She was half naked with a plastic bag over her head and she had sustained some major bruising to her face. The victim was identified as 20-year-old Haley Morgan, who sometimes used the last name Marshall. Her friends had reported her missing just two days earlier, on May 25th. Although not much is documented about Haley's earlier life, what is known is that she was a local sex worker who operated from the Luke Street area, near to where she lived. She was also addicted to heroin. Haley's cause of death was established as being a heroin overdose and asphyxiation, and her battered and bruised face told the coroner that she'd been assaulted before her demise. He believed that she'd been punched and kicked, causing bruising to her face and a cut over her left eyebrow. Investigators believed that the 20-year-old had been killed elsewhere and dumped in the alley where she was found. During the initial inquiry, four people consisting of two men aged 30 and 28, and two women aged 25 and 18, were arrested in connection with the case and taken in for questioning. However, no charges were ever brought against the four. Detectives revealed that the four were participants in the sex work and drug dealing scene, but their identities have never been made public. Haley's partner at the time was also investigated, and although never charged with the murder, they were placed on probation for 18 months after admitting to living off the 20-year-old's earnings, although it was determined that there was no coercion or corruption by the partner. At Haley's inquest, an open verdict was recorded, meaning that the jury confirmed the death was suspicious, but they were unable to reach any other verdict. While Haley's case is cold and unsolved, her demise is just one in a string of horrific sex worker murders that plagued Hull during the 1990s and early 2000s. The first victim in the series of slayings was a 29-year-old named Samantha Class, whose body was recovered on October 1st, 1997, after washing up on the banks of the River Humber and North Ferriby. She had been beaten and strangled before she was thrown into the estuary of the River Humber and later washed ashore. Like Haley, Samantha was a prostitute and heroin user, and her friends had reported her missing in the days before she was found. After Haley's body was discovered eight months later, panic began to spread that there was a serial killer on the loose. Although the Humberside police insisted they were not yet unduly concerned, as there was nothing to actually link the crimes, their deaths had been completely different, and there was no shared evidence or MO across the two cases. The third victim who was reportedly friends with Haley was Natalie Club, a 25-year-old mother of three. She was last seen alive on April 28, 1998, and essentially vanished off the face of the earth, until the manager of a pumping station was brought a black plastic bin liner containing parts of her remains by his dog three months later. The bag had been lying in a pile of drying sludge on the side of a drain in Holderness, an area of Yorkshire. The remainder of her body was eventually located, but it was clear that her killer had tried hard to dispose of her body. She had been dismembered using a hacksaw, Natalie's boyfriend had reported her missing the month after she was last seen. Humberside police assured the media and the public that they had explored the idea that the women were killed by a serial killer, recruiting experts to create psychological profiles for the perpetrator in each case, and examining the evidence for similarities across all three of the victims. However, DCI Paul Davison told news outlets, there is a possibility, and then again there is not. Eventually, the serial killer theory was dismantled when the truth about some of the crimes came to light. In July of 1998, a man named Gary Allen was stopped in Boulevard, West Hull, and arrested for drink driving. As a result of his arrest, a sample of his DNA was taken, and it was found to match the DNA located on the body of a 29-year-old Samantha Class. Following this discovery, Allen was charged with Samantha's murder in October, and he went on trial in 2000 at Sheffield Crown Court where the jury was told he'd had intercourse with Samantha on the night of her murder, and that he'd scrapped his vehicle the following day. However, the jury returned a verdict of not guilty, and Alan was acquitted of the charge. Law enforcement said that Samantha's case would not be reopened, and that they would not look at charging anyone else. Meanwhile, in 1998, the boyfriend of Natalie Club, 35-year-old Darren Adams, who reported her missing in May that year, was charged with her murder. It was discovered that in the early hours of May 13th, Adams had stabbed Natalie several times in the chest before going to a friend who he recruited to help him dispose of the body. The pair placed Natalie's body in a bathtub and used a hacksaw to dismember her before they disposed of the remains. In 2000, Adams, now 37, was convicted and jailed for the murder. 
He died in November of 2017, close to his potential release date. Although the serial killer theory fell apart, both Samantha's murder and Haley's remain unsolved. Amanda McGuinness, Gaffney, South Carolina. Gaffney, South Carolina is known as the peach capital of South Carolina due to the peach hold, a 135 foot water tower that resembles a giant peach. The huge water tower holds 1 million US gallons of water, visible for several miles around, and is one of the most recognizable landmarks for travelers along the I-85 between Charlotte, North Carolina and Atlanta, Georgia. It is also home of our patron Amanda, and for you Amanda, we'll first take a look at the mysterious disappearance of Donnie Edward Pennington. Little is known about the life and background of Gaffney resident Donnie Edward Pennington, a 42-year-old married man employed as a carpenter. A search of Donnie's name online returns only a small handful of articles about his uncharacteristic disappearance. In the early 2000s, Donnie was last seen at his residence at 8 o'clock on the evening of March 4, 2006. His home was located in the vicinity of Tim Ken Road and the 2200 block of Old Georgia Highway. He told his wife that he was going to visit a friend and he would be back in about an hour, but the 42-year-old never returned home. Three days later on March 7th, Donnie's wife filed a missing persons report. She explained to investigators that she had delayed reporting him missing because it was common practice for him to stay at a friend's for a few days, but he had never been gone this long, especially without communication. Progress in Donnie's case is extremely limited, and according to his Charlie Project page, foul play is not suspected. It is unclear what has made law enforcement somewhat rule out this possibility. In March of 2020, hopes of closure for Donnie's loved ones were raised. When the Cherokee County Sheriff's Office began excavating a property located off Oak Ridge Road, about 15 minutes away from the 42-year-old's residence. Investigators on the scene inspected the area of a 26-foot deep well on the abandoned property. Their reason for searching the premises was because authorities had received an anonymous tip that a male may have been murdered in the home and dumped in the well about 10 years prior. The tip led law enforcement to request a search warrant, which was promptly granted to them. They then searched the well, took soil samples, and collected other evidence for testing. Additionally, they located and questioned the former residents of the property. However, it does not appear that anything further has come of this lead, or at least, it has so far not been linked with Donnie's disappearance. A year later in May 2021, the skeletal remains of a man were found in the woods near 6th Street, Gaffney. However, they were soon identified as those of Robert Edward Bumgardner Jr. The 65-year-old was reportedly homeless by choice at the time of his demise, and foul play is not suspected in his death. In 2008, Donnie's case was one of those included on a pack of cards designed to be distributed to inmates in 28 different prisons. However, this led to no new tips or witnesses coming forward. Donnie's case has largely remained cold since the night he vanished. He went missing from his residence in the vicinity of Timken Road and the 2200 block of Old Georgia Highway in Gaffney, South Carolina. He was 42 years old at the time and is described as being a white male with blonde hair and blue eyes. He was balding at the time of his disappearance and is between six foot and six foot two and weighed around 210 to 213 pounds when he was last seen. If Donnie is still alive, he will be 85 years old. Haunted Watermill Leroy Martin, also known as the Gaffney Strangler, was a serial killer from Gaffney. Between 1967 and 1968, he murdered four women, two of whom were schoolgirls. At the time of the murders, Martin was employed at a textile mill in Cherokee County and was married with three children. His first victim was 32-year-old Annie Lucelle Dedmond, who was found murdered and raped. Initially, her husband, Roger Dedmond, was arrested and convicted of a murder and was sentenced to 18 years in prison. With the real killer still at large, two more women went missing. Shortly after their disappearances, Martin anonymously called Bill Gibbons, then editor of the Gaffney Ledger, and gave him directions to locate the two bodies. He also insisted that he was responsible for the murder of Annie Dedmond, 
not her husband. Gibbons reported the information to police, who then found the bodies of Nancy Carol Paris, aged 20, and 14-year-old Nancy Christine Reinhardt. Four days later, Martin contacted Gibbons again, warning that there would be more killings. On February 13, 1968, 15-year-old Opal Diana Buxon was abducted and thrown into the truck of a car while walking to a school bus stop with her sister. Her sister was able to give a description of the vehicle to authorities, and police later found Buxon's body in a wooded area several days later. Martin was later arrested, however he was not given adequate right to counsel, and so authorities did not seek the death penalty. Martin was convicted of first-degree murder and received four life terms. After Martin's arrest, the wrongly convicted Roger Dedmond was released and all charges against him were dropped. Martin later confessed in interviews that he had split personality, including a violent side that took control of him and made him murder. On May 31, 1972, while incarcerated at Central Correctional Institution in Columbia, Martin was stabbed to death by fellow inmate Kenneth Marshall Rumsey. In the aftermath of the killings, it's been reported that the old watermill in Gaffney was the location that one of the murder victims was found, and ever since the area has been haunted by her spirit, and those who have visited the area have felt very uneasy and unwelcome. Others have reported being pushed or tugged at by an unseen force. We'd love to know if you've ever visited Amanda, and experienced anything strange. Harry Dawes, Preston, Lancashire, England. For such a small city, Preston in Lancashire, England has quite a history and is responsible for original manufacturing of many of the things we now take for granted, including trams, trains, and aircraft. It is also said to be the home of football, with its Deepdale Stadium being the oldest continuously used football league ground in the world. In addition, the first ever UK motorway, the M6, was built around Preston. And yes, as soon as it was opened, the first ever motorway traffic jam. This is just a few of the things Preston is famous for, as well as being the hometown of Harry, our much valued patron. For you, Harry, we'll take a look at the case of Janet Murgatroyd, followed by the haunted Jingle Hall. Enjoy. On June 15th, 1996, Janet Murgatroyd, an only child and a student at the University of Central Lancashire, headed out for the day to do some shopping in Preston with her friend Fiona Watson. Later that evening, the pair headed to the pub. Fiona recalled, we couldn't have been happier. We were both on top of the world that day. We thought nothing was going to stop us from here on in. It was going to be our last night out before we went on our holidays, so we were making it a good night. The two were having a last night out before they departed together for Rhodes, Greece. From the island, they would travel around Europe for 10 weeks and be back in time for Janet to resume her university studies. Their dream trip had been in the planning stage for months, and the two friends were excited that it was so close. While they were away, they would celebrate Janet's 21st birthday. Around 12.30 a.m., Fiona and Janet left the pub and went their separate ways to head home. CCTV footage would later show Janet weaving through the crowds as she began her journey, and witnesses recalled seeing her passing the Preston railway station. At 1.10 a.m., surveillance tapes showed her reaching the Penwortham Bridge. Around this time, a cab driver spotted a man chasing a blonde-haired girl. Unsure of what was going on, however, he didn't intervene. It is generally believed that this blonde girl was Janet. She was just a mile and a half away from home. About 20 minutes later at 1.30 a.m., two men crossing the bridge heard a muffled, high-pitched wail in the bushes at Priory Park, close to the southern banks of River Ribble which flowed beneath the bridge. Turning to see where the sound was coming from, the men heard twigs snapping and saw the figure of a man crouching. However, due to the darkness, they were unable to identify him or make out any distinguished features. The last thing they saw was a man wearing a light-colored baggy shirt moving unsteadily down the riverbank. The following day in the early afternoon, a dog walker discovered the naked body of a blonde-haired woman floating in the river. When she was eventually pulled to shore, she was quickly identified as 20-year-old Janet Murgatroyd. She had been violently attacked, her body covered in scratches from being dragged through the undergrowth. Her autopsy revealed that she had been severely beaten and kicked around the head, which had caused her to sustain 59 injuries, including a broken nose and fractured jaw. She had been knocked unconscious before her body was dumped in the river. 
Finger-shaped bruises on her face showed that her killer had clamped a hand over her face to stop her screaming. Janet's official cause of death was drowning, and investigators theorised that she had been on the edge of the bank for at least four hours until the high tide pulled her into the water, where she died. Following the horrific crime, a team of 50 was put together, and an incident room in Hutton was set up. Vegetation near the river was bagged up as evidence, and her bloodstained shirt was soon recovered by a newspaper photographer, who noticed it in the brush, near to where the two male witnesses had heard the commotion taking place. Most of Janet's clothing and jewellery was soon found, and hairs located on several of the garments were tested in DNA profile, and a DNA profile was pulled from them. Her size 10 Wrangler jeans, however, have never been located. During the initial investigation, a group of children playing near the crime scene reportedly discovered them, but by the time law enforcement arrived, the jeans were missing. They are the only item of Janet's that has never been found, prompting speculation that the killer took them as a trophy. Investigators attempted to connect Janet's case with any of the other 200 unsolved cases in the UK at the time, but failed to establish any links. Authorities believe they have a good idea of the kind of person who may have carried out this crime, describing the individual as someone who attacked in rage and lacked any premeditated planning. They believe the offender would have been of a younger age at the time of the crime and is disorganized. He likely had a history of violence against women, possibly, but not necessarily, resulting in convictions. He likely had a thorough knowledge of the area, suggesting he was from or currently lived in the area at the time of the crime. During the original investigation, 1,400 statements were taken from those offering information to the police, and a reconstruction of Janet's last movements was made. The BBC's Crime Watch programme ran a segment on the crime, which led to a further 50 tips, although none panned out. In August of 1999, about three years after the murder, a man named Andrew Greenwood, who was 25 years old and would have been 22 in 1996, confessed to the crime. However, in the years leading up to his trial, he retracted his confession on numerous occasions, and furthermore, no physical evidence appeared to connect him to the case. The main evidence against Greenwood is that the information in his confession lined up with the information investigators had. He later claimed that this was because he had become obsessed with the case and read about it in the papers, and followed reports about it on the news. He added that he was blackout drunk on the night of the murder, and had no actual recollection of events that night. Greenwood's defence pointed the finger at Janet's ex-boyfriend, a man who was in his thirties in 1996, named John Parkinson. It came to light that Parkinson had at some point been accused of being violent towards and raping his wife. Additionally, Janet had complained about Parkinson's violent behaviour, and her accusations had been recorded on tape. Furthermore, on the night of the murder at 1.04am, he attempted to call her home from Watery Lane, just two miles from Penwitham Bridge, and blood found on boxes in his home was proven to belong to Janet. Yet Parkinson was never charged, in connection with the case. While Greenwood's defence brought this information up at his trial, they were instructed to dismiss it. Still, during Greenwood's first trial, the jury failed to reach a verdict. His second trial in 2003 resulted in a conviction, which led to him being sentenced to jail for eight years. However, Greenwood's conviction was squashed in 2004 due to lack of evidence. Janet's case is still unsolved. She was buried at Hill Road Cemetery on September 3rd, 1996. Jingle Hall. On a slightly lighter note, Preston also has a few haunted buildings, and we're going to take a look at the most famous, Chingle Hall. Nowadays, the 13th century Chingle Hall is a private residence that comes with its own haunted chapel and several creepy priest halls, and over the years, Chingle Hall has become very famous for its paranormal activity. The kitchen is said to be plagued by poltergeist activity, with items frequently being moved around and the lights turning on and off for no apparent reason. A full-body apparition has also manifested at the property, and paranormal investigators have been called in to investigate the property, and have allegedly captured spirit lights and EVP evidence. A former resident is thought to be responsible. His name is Father John Wall, who was born at the property in the 17th century, but was later hanged for heresy in Worcester in 1679. His head was taken to France, but it's believed to have been eventually brought back to Preston and was buried in the grounds of the hall. 
Harry, we'd love to know if you've ever walked past this place or seen it. So that's it for this episode of Too Close to Home. We'd like to say a massive thank you to the five patrons featured in this video, Jose, Rio, Amanda, James and Harry. Without the Patreon support like yours, none of this would be possible. Remember, if you'd like your hometown featured on an episode of Too Close to Home, and also like exclusive access to all of our documentaries on Patreon, including our Murderous Minds documentary series, and Minds of Madness, then don't forget to head over to Patreon for more information. Thanks for watching, and as always, we'll see you in the next video.